Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. In this video, we're going to be going over all the steps that's required to make a farm table. This particular table was made as a wedding gift, so I went ahead and put that video together and I also put together a set of plans and you can learn more about those plans in the link below in the description or by visiting my website, thehomesteadcraftsman.com. In this particular video, we're going to be going over the steps to make the table legs, the aprons, the top, and all of the painting, distressing, and the polyurethane for the top. Let's get started. I'll start with the legs, cutting them to length on my miter saw. I'm using 3.5 by 3.5 Douglas fir from Lowe's, commonly known as 4x4s, but these particular ones are not treated. I have no idea what people use them for in a construction application, but they work great as table legs. Once they're cut to length, I mark the centers, connecting corner to corner, creating an X in the center with a ruler. This allows you to mount the piece of wood right on the centers on the lathe. If you don't have a lathe, you can check Craigslist for an inexpensive lathe, maybe $50, $75, or $100 or so, and you'll have a nice tool for your shop. And if you don't have a lathe and you don't want a lathe, or you don't think you can use one, don't have room, whatever reason, you can make a different shaped leg or buy one. If you are going to make a different shaped leg, I have a video on my channel about making square tapered legs. A couple seconds ago, you saw me mark out a dimension on the leg itself, and that is the upper portion of the leg where the mortise and tenon joint will be for the apron and leg joint. From that point to the right, I use a roughing gouge to bring the leg into round or pretty close to round. I like to leave little flats on the sides of my legs. It adds a little extra bulk and a little interesting detail when I go to do the distressing. I create that crisp shoulder with the skew chisel and then move on to marking out the elements of my turned leg. These upper parts of the legs, these beads, are then turned out with the skew chisel and I use it like a scraper. That's not its traditional way to be used, but it works great and it makes quick work of such a simple shape. It allows you to flip it back and forth and get into any angle with that nice little point the skew chisel has. Now in this video, I'm just showing you the way that I turn my table legs and the way they're laid out in the plans, but you can make them any style you want. One easy thing to do is to turn a couple sample legs if you want to do something different and see what looks best. If you're making it for a customer, you can draw some different pictures, show it to them, and then let them choose. But for me, I'm sticking with something simple as I think it appeals to the widest range of people. When it comes to sanding your leg, it's best to sand on top and towards the back. That way, if you were ever to hang up or get anything caught up on the actual spinning piece of wood, it's not gonna pull your hands into the lathe like I'm demonstrating here. So sand on top and towards the back. Your desired level of distressing will determine how much you sand your table legs. If you want a rougher leg, don't worry about getting them so smooth. In the case of this table, I'm turning all the table legs with traditional wood turning tools but normally I use a duplicator that I made for my lathe out of plywood, an angle grinder, and a Lancelot blade. It basically just follows a template like a key making machine. If you want to learn more about that, click the link in the description below. But for this table, like I said, I'm doing it all by hand just to show you all the steps. Once you get one table leg made, you use that leg to mark out all the dimensions onto your next leg blank. Turn that, then turn the third and the fourth. For this table, I'll be using mortise and tenon joints, a traditional woodworking joint where a square peg goes in a square hole, and it's common for tables. I'll cut my mortises using a hollow chisel mortiser, and if you don't have one of these, don't worry about it. There's a number of ways to cut mortises. You can even cut them just with a chisel and a mallet, but you can use a drill press, a hand drill, a router. There's a, tons of different ways. Don't worry about it if you don't have some of the tools that I have in my shop. Once I'm done cutting the mortises, I move on to the aprons. And for that, I'll be using 2x6 lumber from Lowe's. That's just normal spruce 2x6s. And I start out by skimming them through my planer, just making sure they're all a consistent thickness. A planer can normally be a very messy tool along with a lot of other woodworking equipment, so I thought I would show my simple setup. It's a Harbor Freight dust collector with a trash can separator, and then I have one of the little dust hoods that you can buy to fit a portable planer. My particular one is the Porter Cable from Lowe's. Once I get them all plain to a consistent thickness, I rip them to their width and then cross cut them to their length. I do my ripping on the table saw and my cross cutting on the radial arm saw. For cutting my tenons, I also use the radial arm saw but put my dado stack on it to take a wider cut and not have to deal with just a single blade thickness. I set up a stop on the fence on my radial arm saw and then move my apron down until I cut it to its full length. 
It's a very easy and fast process, but it does rely on you making sure that your apron boards are all the exact thickness. Other options for cutting tenons are using a table saw with a tenon jig or a crosscut sled. You can also use a router or you can cut them out by hand with a saw and then clean them up with a hand plane. The next step in shaping the tenons is cutting them to their width. You're going to remove waste off the top and the bottom and I do so by marking out the width of the tenon directly from the mortise on the leg. When I'm just making one table I go ahead and do it by hand but when I'm doing a number of tables I cut all of these with the bandsaw. I set the fence, cut one side and then readjust the fence and cut the other side. My tenons are shifted down one inch from the top of the apron board and this allows the mortise to be shifted down in the leg which I feel is a stronger way to go about the mortise and tenon joint. Most of my apron boards are on the wider side, but in situations where I want to allow a little extra leg room, I stick with my wider apron board and then I'll cut out a relief area. Normally I just take out about an inch and then I'll do some sort of simple transition from that one inch relief back down to the full width. In this case, I just did a curve that was traced out from a cap I had laying around the shop. You can cut this out a number of ways. Sometimes I just use a jigsaw, but in most cases I use my bandsaw. And this is another opportunity to be creative and make your table unique. And there's a comparison of the two different aprons I offer. With the aprons complete, all the components of the base are now ready to assemble. I use Titebond 2 premium wood glue and band clamps to glue up all of my table bases. I use chip brushes to apply the glue to all of these surfaces, both the tenons and the mortises, to avoid any sort of a dry fit. Using band clamps on your own can be kind of tricky. They flop all around, so one thing you can do to make it easy is place a clamp on each leg to help hold them while you get them in place and tightened up. Once clamped, I let my table bases sit overnight for the glue to dry. The next morning, I drill 3 8 inch holes through the tenons, and these will be used to peg the joint later with 3 8 dowels after I get done painting the table base. With that done, I set the base to the side and start on the tabletop. For that, I'm using some oak boards that I already have planed, but I need to get their edges straight so I can glue them into a slab. I use a track saw to do all my joining, but you can use a joiner, a router, or a circular saw following a straight edge, a joiner hand plane. There's a number of ways to go about it. Or you can just get them as straight as possible, and instead of gluing them together, you can screw them together from underneath with a with pocket hole joinery or just with some strips of wood going perpendicular. Once I get them all jointed, I like to lay them out on my table base and figure out exactly the orientation that I want them all to make the top as attractive as possible. A lot of woodworkers run into the problem of their board shifting once clamping pressure is applied and there's a lot of different little tips for avoiding this but I find the easiest to be using biscuit joints between your boards. You can see me here marking out the placement of all those biscuits. I usually use three, four, maybe sometimes five of those starting two inches in from either end. And then all they're doing is basically putting a small little football shaped piece of wood, a little flat piece between the boards which avoid them actually being able to shift apart. This is an extra step in the process of making a tabletop, but well worth it. I started out clamping all my tops together using pipe clamps, but then graduated to using this clamping rack that I made using 2x4s and screw type clamps. It allows me to clamp all my tops together vertically, keeping them out of the way so I can continue working in the shop. Regardless of your gluing method, be sure to put glue on both edges when gluing your boards together. And then also I'm putting those biscuits in the slots. Now for doing sanding, I've got a pretty fancy tool that's not common in every shop, and that is a thickness sander. This is a Supermax 2550, and I've done some videos on that if you'd like to learn more. Most people out there are just going to be sanding their tabletops down with belt sanders and orbital sanders, basically some sort of hand-held power sander, and that's perfectly fine. A lot of my tabletops, I still use those tools. For the top on this table, I wanted a smoother surface, so I'm filling all of the knot holes and any cracks that are in the surface with epoxy. I'm using West System Epoxy. I buy it in gallons. The actual epoxy comes in a gallon and then the hardener comes in a smaller can. They both have pumps and they're very easy to use. They're not cheap, but they work great. And in my case, selling tables, it's well worth it. Do is put tape on the underside of any hole that I'll be filling. That includes knots and cracks. I then flip the tabletop back over, mix up some of my epoxy, adding in some black chalk to tin it. 
first I fill in the holes and then that epoxy will normally settle down into that void and I'll have to come back in and add a little extra. On that last layer, if you want to get some of those bubbles out of the epoxy, if you kind of flash it with a torch, that'll pop some of those bubbles, but you don't want to put the heat on too long. Once the epoxy sets, I get it all flush with my belt sander. When I clamp up my tabletops, I leave the boards long and I square them up in the end with my track saw. This makes for a very straight and clean cut. I come back and I put a heavy bevel on the underside of the table and then a light chamfer to the top edge. And with everything constructed, it's now time to start the finishing process. I'm going to start with the top. In the end, it's going to get stained and polyurethaned. I start by sanding down its surface to 220 grit with my orbital sander and then vacuuming off to remove any dust. You can also use a tack cloth or blow it off with an air compressor. I chose a Minwax stain for this table and I'm using golden oak. Before applying your finish, make sure the stain is completely dry, otherwise it can bleed out of the wood underneath the top coat. While my stain is drying, I go ahead and quickly paint the table base black. In the end, it's getting distressed, so don't worry about being too careful. Just get the paint on the surface. When building furniture, there's usually never a time where you can't work on something. There's always a time where something's drying, uh, glue, paint, finish, whatever it is. So while my base is drying, I've gone back to the top and I'm applying the polyurethane. I start with the bottom. You want to make sure that you apply finish to the top and the bottom of your projects when possible and this helps with moisture and cupping of your tabletops. First apply it to the bottom, then flip the tabletop over and apply the first coat to the top. To achieve a really smooth finish on your tabletops, you're gonna sand in between coats, but only after the polyurethane has completely dried. And that kind of goes for any type of finish you're using, whether it's oil or water-based. You can distress your tables a number of ways. I like to just use a random orbital sander going around lightly sanding the surface. I don't go overboard because it can look a little bit contrived and I'm not a fan of that. Now's the time you want to go ahead and hammer in your 3 8 inch dowels before you put on the clear coat. Just a small dot of glue into the holes keeps any glue from squeezing out past the dowels. There's no need to wait for that glue to dry. You can go ahead and apply the clear coat to your table base. I use Minwax Polycrylic in Satin. I only apply one coat as I don't want the table base to end up with any sort of a plasticky look. Another benefit to using this type of finish is it dries very rapidly, especially when set out in the sun with a black base. This is the fourth and final coat of polyurethane on the tabletop and you want to make sure that it is a very clean surface without any dust, anything on the tabletop at all, otherwise that's going to show in the end result. The last step to finish your table is attaching the top. I use metal tabletop fasteners and you can cut the slots that they go into with a router or a biscuit joiner. I use the biscuit joiner. These slots are cut on the inside of the apron just far enough down to where when you tighten down the screws into the tabletop it cinches in on that slot. I buy these metal tabletop fasteners and the screws that I use with them from McFeely's. If you don't want to use any store-bought fasteners you can make your own. I call them tabletop buttons and I make them out of hardwood. I have a video on my channel and you can check that out if you like. I'll also put the link in the description below. And here's the finished result. A beautiful heirloom piece of furniture that can be passed down to the family and enjoyed for generations to come. And here's a selection of farm tables that I've built for customers in a variety of wood types, colors, and sizes. Well, that brings the project to an end. I hope you all enjoyed the process of seeing a farm table being built. Like I said before, I'm offering a set of plans and you can see those plans on my website, thehomesteadcraftsman.com or by clicking the link in the description. For those of you who don't want to follow plans, of course, you can just go along, make some decisions and build the table exactly how you like it. But for those of you who do like the guide of having a set of plans, they are available. So be sure to check them out and thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.
If you enjoyed this video and would like to subscribe to my channel, click the round icon to the left and easily follow along with all my future projects. There's also a suggested video to the right and below that a link to my website where I sell woodworking plans, t-shirts, and my book about making money woodworking. Thanks again.